The Honourable, Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm pleased to rise today following my uh, good friend from Edmonton, Griesbach, who talked about uh, his own personal experience with his family and as a former union member himself. And I hope to contribute to the debate here on C4 today, uh, dispel some of the myths uh, continuing to be uh, uh, brought to this place by some of uh, my colleagues in government, and, and really talk about, in depth, the two reforms that C4 essentially dismantles. Uh, what I would say, modernization of the labour movement uh, from the last parliament that's being dismantled in C4, Madam Speaker. But first, you know, I, I am concerned when members of this place suggest that um, those measures being unwound in C4 are attacks on union members or attacks on the labour movement. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth, Madam Speaker. You've heard statistics from polls that have shown that union members support the measures contained in both Bill C-525 and 377 from the last Parliament. And in many ways, the labour movement is the last uh, large portion of our society to embrace the modern conce concepts of transparency that are really commonplace throughout uh, government th of all levels, throughout the charitable sector. Um, and it's sad that it takes Parliament to pull the movement into this modern age of transparency and disclosure, but it was something that was supported by union members. So there is no dismantling of rights. There is no attack. And I'm going to try and spend a few moments to talk about what those bills contained and why it is a bad public policy move to step away from these modernization uh, efforts for the labour movement. But more importantly, why it's not an attack, Madam Speaker, is like many of my colleagues, I was elected to Parliament in 2012 and in the last general election by, to a large extent, members of unions. Um, I'm very proud to have some of my best door knockers who are either former or current members of the CAW, now Unifor, working in our auto industry at General Motors in Oshawa, Madam Speaker. Very proud to have the strong support of members of the Power Workers Union, uh, working both at the Darlington Generating Station in my riding and in Pickering Station near, nearby. When I ran for office, I spoke to Don McKinnon, the head of that union, uh, who's been a very good advocate for clean and reliable nuclear energy, and I rely on the expertise that a lot of leading figures in the labour movement bring to their sectors. Uh, I consulted those same members uh, in our trade agreements when I was Parliamentary Secretary for International Trade in the last Parliament. So I'm very proud to represent these people who do get benefits from belonging to their union. And we've heard lots of speeches about how over the last century the union movement has been helpful and has advocated public policy and these sorts of things. Nothing in the two bills from the last parliament took any of that away. And it's really cowardice of debate when people have to hide the real actions of C4 behind saying unions brought us health care and unions brought us weekends. Let's talk about what was in those bills from the previous parliament and what C4 is attempting to do, Madam Speaker. Let's not wrap it up in trappings of, you know, unions have made a large and profound impact on our society. They have. And this, none of these moves were right-to-work movements or banishing unions. This was about making sure that movement which is supported through tax exemption status, which is supported by the RAND formula, meaning dues are paid under compulsion, much like taxes are. You cannot pick or choose whether you pay this out of your paycheck. So that, that inherent fact means that the movement needs to embrace these concepts themselves, Madam Speaker, and it's, it's disappointing they didn't. So for people that have been following this debate at home, Bill C-4 is essentially the new Liberal government's attempt at unwinding two very modest reforms from the previous Parliament. The first is Bill C-525, which was a bill that brought essentially the secret ballot to union certification. And what is interesting 
is the secret ballot has been the underpinning of our parliamentary electoral process since a Liberal government of uh, Prime Minister Mackenzie brought it in in 1874, Madam Speaker. And I think it's considered now a fundamental element of elections in Canada, where there's a secret ballot so that people can place their X in a way they determine is best, without fear of somebody watching, without fear of repercussions. It is essentially a basic tenet of our parliamentary democracy in Canada, yet it is somehow absurd to extend that same protection, a secret ballot, meaning you can truly vote how you feel is best for your personal view, uh, to the certification vote, which I guess by saying that it shouldn't be there is the certification vote some, some, somehow outside of normal tenets of democracy, Madam Speaker? That's all I can determine from some of the comments here because comments that rights are being taken away and attacks on union movement. People in Canada need to know this C525 was the secret ballot. I'm sure a lot of Canadians that don't belong to a union are probably surprised there was no secret ballot. Uh, before, Madam Speaker. So this is what we're talking about. And I've heard about some members say there'd be intimidation by employers, this sort of thing. That's nonsense. The secret ballot is inherently secret. There is no employer there watching the vote, and the votes will not be named. So someone has, can exercise their democratic right to cast a ballot the way they see fit for their own personal views, and the way they see fit for the future of their workforce, whether to stay in the form of, of a non-unionized environment or to unionize. And really, unions should be embracing the concept of having a full and robust democratic measure as part of their originating entrance into a workplace. Why would they shy away from a secret ballot? It's a fundamental pillar for all levels of government and the Labour movement should endorse that. The second, Madam Speaker, is C4 unwinds Bill C377 uh, from the last Parliament. You've heard a lot of people getting very heated about that subject as well. And that's similarly disappointing that such legislation had to be brought forward and the Labour movement wouldn't embrace this concept themselves, Madam Speaker. Yet again, another Liberal government, in fact, the father of the current Prime Minister brought in access to information uh, legislation in 1983. And in subsequent years, all provincial levels of government and virtually all major municipal, large municipalities have embraced this same concept where there will be transparency. If you pay your taxes by compulsion, you should be able to know where that money goes and to assess whether it's being well spent. That same basic and it extends into the charitable sector as well, which through the CRA and through, uh, through its tax assist, through charitable donations, has similar responsibilities on disclosure to allow Canadians to assess where that money is being spent. So why should one part of our society, in this case the union movement, be exempt from a generational move towards transparency? I, I quite frankly don't understand it. And with a $5,000 threshold, Madam Speaker, you know, CRA and the Government of Canada is not looking into the children's Christmas party for, for an organization. But if an organization is backing a major political campaign like the Working Families in Ontario, or sending delegates to a large uh, convention overseas that's taking positions that would be adverse to Canadian principles, uh, they should be able to see where that money is being spent because the government has allowed that money to be spent on a tax-exempt basis, Madam Speaker. So politicians at all levels, the charitable sector, um, Canadians know that, that this is a commonplace now. Transparency. It, it's, the, this new government mentions it on occasion. This same level of transparency has been in effect in the United States. The brothers or sister union movement uh, since the Kennedy administration. So with C4, two fundamental reforms that would be good for the Labour movement are being withdrawn, Madam Speaker. It concerns this side of the House, 
and hopefully it should concern more and more Canadians. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? Questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member from Spadina, Fort York. Thank you. To the speaker, I, I listened to the member's uh, comments uh, from the opposite bench, and and uh, I'm a little troubled. Uh, for, for, there are political parties that stand for small government, and when you hear those parties talk about the reach they want into every single civil institution, whether it's a First Nations band or a labor union, I mean, next they'll be deciding whether or not that the the, the the members of the church we send across to Rome to elect the Pope should have to publicly declare how they're voting and expending their, their, their dollars. How far a reach would that party seem uh, deemed, deemed to be to be justified to reach into every self-organized democratic body in this country and decide they are going to make a decision on what's good for them? They will assess the dollars spent as whether it's in keeping with Canadian principle. I think the, the gentleman said, uh, "How far a reach does this does this uh, would this party contemplate? How many democratic institutions does it want to run besides itself in this parliament?" The honourable member for Durham. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and, and that's a very good question my friend from Spadina, Fort York asked. And the question is simple. Any organization that the Government of Canada has given tax exemption status to or requires Canadians to pay by compulsion dues or taxes or levies to should know at a fundamental uh, level they can see how that money is spent. Um, to bring it home to the Honourable Member, I am sitting in this Parliament a few early, years earlier than I intended, in large part because the previous MP uh, had had some issues with spending disclosures. Orange juice or other things were disclosed. This is the era of transparency, which that side uses from time to time as a term, but in their first 100 days, they're removing that same basic transparency in C4 from the Labour Movement and from First Nations governments, it's a step backwards, Madam Speaker. Comments, questions et commentaires? The Honourable Member from uh, Prince Albert. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I've often wondered about this, why now? You know, of all the things that are going on in Canada, why bring this legislation forward now? And I, I look at things and I go back to Saskatchewan and what's important to us is, of course, is jobs and the economy and what's going on in Saskatchewan in regards to that. I look across eastern Canada and the manufacturing sector and how there's lack of performance in jobs and exports in that sector and how it's not competitive here in Ontario because of provincial rules. Can he explain to me, the member explained to me, why did the Liberal Party feel it's necessary to take their first action here in the House of Commons in their first 100 days to repeal this legislation? Can you give us some insight on what he thinks is the reason behind that? Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank my friend from Prince Albert. He always has very insightful questions uh, in this House. And while I can't suggest to put myself in the shoes of the new government, um, and certainly wouldn't want to be in those shoes, Madam Speaker, if you look at their first 100 days, which there was a snazzy video out on the first 100 days, but if you look at the legislative agenda, you move apart C1, which is a formulaic administration of oaths bill, C2 was tax increases and the elimination of TFSA. C3 was massive injection of spending, in large part to cover a uh, promise on the Syrian refugee resettlement. Uh, C4 is the unwinding of uh, labour uh, modernization from the previous parliament, clearly a, a quid pro quo for support during the election. And C5 is undoing the sick day uh, negotiation with the public service. So if you look at the legislative agenda of the new government in the first 100 days, um, it's tax, spend, and support the friends that got them into office. Contrast that with the Harper government's first 100 days, or the previous government, you have the Accountability Act, you have child care benefit for all families, and a GST reduction. It was about giving back to Canadians, not taking away. 